Welcome. Hello, everybody. Welcome to session three of this year's Women on the Move, when we speak to authors about their lives, their careers, and their latest books. My name is Marjorie Schuster. I'm the coordinator of literary events here at the Temple Emanuel Stryker Center. Today, we have a very special treat to welcome a favorite of mine, the prolific author of, I think it's 22 books, Jacqueline Michard. You may recall that her very first book, The Deep End of the Ocean, was Oprah's first uh, book for her book discussion, book club in 1997. That put Jackie on the map, became a hit movie with Michelle Pfeiffer, and I think there's 3 million copies in print still. As always, type your questions in the chat feature of Zoom. We'll try to get to as many as we can. And of course, I'd like to thank the Samuel I. Newhouse Foundation for their sponsorship of this series. It is now my pleasure to welcome Jacqueline Richard. Hi, Jackie. Hi how are you? I'm just welcome. Fine. Thank you Great. so much for having me. I'm honored. Great. Well, we are thrilled that you're with us. We have a lot to talk about. So I am a big fan, as I told you a little while ago, I believe I've read almost all your books and I could not wait to get my hands on this one. Oh, it's a little bit, the, the Good Son. So let's dive right in. Please tell us a bit about the story and tell us about this world you've created. Well, created is a funny word in this sense because this story was one of those ideas for books come from everywhere. They come from your own life, they come from the news. This one happened to be delivered to me in real life, and it's a story that largely happened in real life. I was at a big writer's conference, and I was standing in line waiting for my coffee when the woman in front of me dropped her book. It was an Anita DeMont book. I noticed that. I picked it up, and I handed it to her, and I said, are you here for the writer's conference? And she said, no, I'm here because I come every weekend to visit my son who is in prison uh, nearby here. He'll be in prison for a very long time. And I thought, oh, don't tell me. Uh, but she did, she needed to, I think. Mm. Um, he had killed the only girl he ever loved, his sweetheart since the seventh grade. He was only 19 years old. And uh, he had no memory of the crime because he had been so messed up on drugs at uh, methamphetamine specifically that I guess he believed she was someone else. And he, uh, and he would be in prison for maybe 15 or 20 years from the time that I was speaking to his mom. Mm. And she's also said, and this in a different way, in a very different way is, also part of the novel that once she went to the cemetery to put roses on the girl's grave and the girl's mother showed up and the mother was terrified of the boy, the mother of the boy and she, but they ended up crying in each other's arms. They had been neighbors and the mother of the girl said, you're luckier because at least you can still touch him. And her I, I was running, they were introducing me to give this keynote speech. I was running up the aisle. That's how long I stayed with her. I could not bear to tear myself away. And when I told my agent, I'm going to write a novel about this, he had one word for that. No. <laughs> he said, that is very depressing and you could never make those people identifiable. But apparently... He doesn't, he doesn't think that anymore. <laughs> Apparently he was wrong. Do we have any idea if this, if this woman ever get in touch with you? Do you think she read it or you don't know? I have no idea. I wish I knew where she was. Mm -hmm. I wish that I could uh, give the book to her because the power of being a writer, it's like you can correct life. You can change life and you can make it different in the way that you hope that it will be. And, uh, and so I wish that I could give her this vision of the story that she told me. Well, I think the reason to me that your books are so, uh, they resonate so with me because they're so emotional. You know, they really tap into everybody's feelings. And in this book, for me, it tapped into a feeling of being a mother. I have three grown children. I know you have about 25 children. About 25 children. Yes. <laughs> tell, tell everybody how many you have. In real life, I have nine children through birth and adoption. All, all my daughters were adopted. 
Oh, that's wonderful. Wow. Um, yeah. But but having children and having, I don't know, having children, you know, and, and particularly in this book, the mother-son relationship, I just thought was so fascinating. Um, can she ever forgive him? How do they move on past this event? Is she a little afraid of him? All that, right? All those things. Her right. emotions, Thea's emotions towards Stefan are very complex. She right. doesn't know whether she needs to fear him. Uh, she doesn't know. And she has a, a considerable amount of resentment for him because she had a good life. She and her husband were both college professors. He was a coach. And when this happened, it torpedoed their whole existence when um, he was convicted for the death of his sweetheart, Belinda, and a, a crime of which he has, for which he has no memory, uh, again, because of drugs. And uh, it, the, the Thea feels as though through no fault of her own, now the people who used to like her now shun her. Her own family isn't sure of her half the time, though they do come to they do come to embrace Stefan again when he gets out of prison and and are able to help him go forward to a certain degree. But she has lived and in this abyss. She was just walking down the street and suddenly her life uh, imploded. Does she feel responsible? At, at any course. mother might right. Of course. Don't you feel responsible when any, I mean, you can't sure. help but do that. And I think that redounds more even to a mother than it does to a father yes. in terms of the mother is supposed to be that last bastion of civility or instruction in a family. And when a child fails, it isn't necessarily to the father that people look, but to the mother. That's very interesting because that was something I wanted to talk to you about. Why do you think that is? But I think it's it's accurate what you just said. I think it's because for good or ill, as many times as the world has turned, the mother is still the primary caregiver in right. a family. And the mother is still perceived as the one who should be accountable for that child's uh, emotions, maybe. Yes, for that child's emotional well-being, certainly, right. and for the sins that that child commits and to a certain degree is uh, praised for less often, but praised for the child doing well. And Thea feels that she is unfairly targeted and that people are looking at her and wondering, what did you do wrong? Right, exactly. Um, what I found was an interesting, did I interrupt? No, 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 not at all. <laughs> what I found was an interesting device. You talk a lot about Stefan's childhood. Like in Thea's memory, she's thinking about the soccer team or the various different things that he did. That brings us back to the sweet little boy that he was. And I guess that's on purpose. We're supposed to think about that, right? Uh, I definitely. And what I uh, had thought to say was that I once saw a speech given a uh, TED Talk by Sue Klebold, oh. whose child was Dylan Klebold, one of the shooters at Columbine. And she talked extensively about that, about the fact that nothing will ever convince her. And the audience, I think, was astonished that she still loved her son. She said, I'll always love my son. And I'll always be convinced that I was a good mother. I never knew anything. People don't believe that I know. Sure, did I think he had changed as he gotten older? Was he hostile? Yes, all teenagers are. But she felt that there was no way that anything that she or her husband had done or failed to do had contributed to what happened at Columbine. Wow. Um, a few months ago, we had Lionel Shriver uh, with us, and she wrote that book, We Need to Talk About Kevin, um, very much about this, this uh, incident, yeah. Um, let's talk about the parents, the father, the relationship. Do you think that changes? I guess the whole family's dynamic changes. The father seemed very remote to me. That's what the editors said too. Oh, interesting. And they wanted him to be more involved. And I said, he is as involved as he would be. Oh. The importance of he, I mean, they stayed married. They were an intact family. Certainly, 
he loved his son, but he was able to immerse himself in the things that made his life livable in his recruitment trips and his coaching and the things that absorbed him basically 24 seven, at least nine or 10 months out of the year so that he was able to stay sane. And no one really resented that because for two reasons, I think. One is because they understood how necessary that was for him emotionally. And also because people just don't expect as much from the father when it's in terms of when you're in the valley of the shadow. And I am not, I mean, I'm married to a great guy who is a great father and he, but, (laughs) but a, uh, as one of my girlfriends said, a great father is an eight celled creature. (laughs) And um, there just isn't as much of a 24 seven up all night kind of demand unless the father is single. Right. So do you have the book in front of you? I'd love you to read us your first sentence. If you don't have it right there, I will, because this is the most powerful sentence I've ever seen in a book. I would. Thank you so much, by the way. <laughs> I sweat blood over those first sentences. Well, this one is I amazing. I can work on it for six weeks. <laughs> and so, yes, I would love you to read it. I don't okay. have it in front of me. So beginning of the book, I was picking my son up at the prison gates when I spotted the mother of the girl he had murdered. Now, if that doesn't draw you in, I don't know what does. <laughs> it had two functions. One certainly is that I wanted to draw people in. I wanted people to have that. Yes, I I will stand in water six inches deep to read the rest of this book. That was one of the things I wanted people to feel. But also it comprises the cast of characters, the primary actors okay. in that. The other mother. Exactly. In that whole drama, it really is the story of two mothers in a sense and their two children. So, yes, it um, it I I really think that within the first few pages, certainly within the first chapter, but maybe in the first 10 pages, you need to know all the questions as a reader. You need to know all the questions that a book is going to raise. And in a sense, the rest of the book is answering those questions. You should be able to, uh, in a sense, though not, though not in the sense you would imagine, the book ends almost exactly where it began at another right. prison, but for reasons you would never imagine. Right, we certainly will not give any of that away, but I would like to talk about that other mother and, and you know there is some sympathy for her as there should be, but she was a little crazy. Well, she was driven mad. Yes. I mean, she was driven mad by uh, by the crime. And, you know, she lost the original title of this book was My Only. Ooh. And because both of those children, I still like that title, mm. I want to say. Um, yeah. But it, because both those children were their parents' only children. They were the whole tree and all the apples on the tree. They were everything to their parents. And when she lost her only, it was like she lost the sun in the sky. She had no reason to go on. She was a widow. And she uh, she felt as though her life had become dust and ash, as anyone does who loses a child. And Jill hadn't lost her child to an illness or an accident. She could look and see the reason why Belinda died. And so her life became devoted to, if you will, to vengeance. But also during the course of that vengeance, she drew attention through the organization she started, which was called Say, Stop Abuse Young. She drew attention to dating violence, which is a huge issue. And at the it's at the level that domestic violence was generations ago where people just basically sort of ignored it or law enforcement ignored it that but what kind of treatment young women sometimes receive at the hands of their women in college or high school at the hands of their boyfriends he was a little intense for a young uh, boy Stefan the way he loved this girl so much at such a young age 
It's a story about obsession. He was definitely obsessed with Belinda as, as the mothers were obsessed with their children, as Thea became, Thea was obsessed with helping Stefan start a new life after prison. And then gradually as her questions, she never even knew what happened that night. As her questions about the night Belinda died began to mount, she became obsessed with that too. So it's really a a story about people who uh, who fasten into that part of their life in which they have um, that it's the awfulness also comprises the big lyric passage in their life. The most important thing that will ever happen to them for good or ill. Well, well, so that brings me to another point. I mean, should he be judged on the worst thing he ever did this I guess he has to be, right? It's such a big question. Yeah. We're a culture who believes in second chances, okay? If you're a president who, you know, steps out on his wife or if you're something, something. um, Should the nature of what he did, it's very difficult to imagine there being a, a second chance for someone responsible for something like that. And yet we say that we believe that people can be changed, that they can start anew. Do we really believe that? I don't think so. I did a lot of research and I talked to a lot of people and it's when people come out of prison after doing their time, after doing the time that was asked of them and doing it without incident, that they are most at risk of offending again, that they're most at risk of suicide or other kinds of terrible behavior because they're lost in the society that they return to. That culture doesn't, they can't go back to their own life. Often because people who are in jail because of bad actions with other people, you can't go back to that crowd but people who are like Stefan, he can't go back to that ordinary college kid, middle-class life that he left behind either because that life isn't having him. So did you know what was going to happen in this story when you started? I mean, did you, did it change along the way? Do you outline it? How do you come up with this amazing thing? I always know. I always know almost exactly what the end is going to be. Almost exactly the words of the end. And what that's going to be as uh, I start into a story, as I start to write. I don't think I would, it would be possible for me to do this otherwise any more than it would be possible for me to like go to the airport and say, I just want an airline ticket <laughs> instead of I want to go to San Diego and I want to get there by 1030 tonight. Right. You know, it to me, it's a very structured thing. Now, I am the only writer, you know, maybe there's others. I'm sure there are others. Um, But I'm the only one that I know who really doesn't change much as I go along. Things change. A few things change. Okay. But in a general way, it stays the course that I have plotted for it. And I think that's in part because I don't want to lose patience with this story. It takes me X number of months, nine, 10 months to write a draft of a story. And I know oh. I have many friends. It takes years and years right. that for them to write a story because so many things change and they're, uh, they're inspired by subplots and the main characters change. And that would drive me nuts. I don't think I could ever stay with anything for five years. Most authors have told us that things change along the way, the characters evolve, et cetera. We haven't heard what you just described. Well, to me, my characters, they're not real, okay? I can make them real to you. And I can make them real enough to me that they make me cry. I believe in them. I imbue them with humanity. But also they do what I tell them to do. If (laughs) <laughs> if I let them have their way, if they came alive to me, I'm sure my characters would just sit on the couch and eat Doritos and drink Pepsi. <laughs> they wouldn't do anything to, to urge the plot forward of my book. 
Well, I was very worried when that poor boy went to work for his uncle in the lumber yard. I didn't even want to see what was going to happen. But thank God you set your phone. <laughs> no. But thank God you didn't make it as bad as it could have been at really when he was in the lumber yard. I was very concerned about that. I knew I knew that something <laughs> harrowing had to happen to him. And actually things that were harrowing happened to him over and over. But yeah. none of them turned out to be well. It depends on what you consider, you know, it, well, no, be, was, if, yeah. yeah, it was pretty bad. So, so tell us a little bit about, about you and tell us about everything else. And tell us a little bit about the first book that became an Oprah um, sensation. How did that all come to be? Well, in a very funny way, it's a funny story and it bears repeating though. I've said it before that there was no Oprah Winfrey book club. Okay. Right. <laughs> and when, uh, when Oprah Winfrey called me to tell me that, you know, when in the, in the, at the end of the nineties, the answering machine wasn't digital. It had a little tape in it. Right. Right. So this is 20, more than 20 years ago. And she left a message and it went on to the end of the tape, you know, like five <laughs> minutes, this is Oprah Winfrey. And I have just loved the deep end of the ocean more than any book that I have read in the last 10. Beep. Oh, that's terrific. You know, and I just, I hope you saved it. Did I just, save it? Well, I erased it. Oh, okay. <laughs> she, both times she called, I erased it because I thought it was someone horsing around with me. Oh boy. <laughs> so the third time she called, uh, a friend of mine was there and he said, Jack, I think that really is Oprah Winfrey. Listen to how mad she is. And she said, you know, this really is Oprah Winfrey. And I don't even know if you live here, but if you do, could you at least do me the courtesy of returning my phone call? So there never, there almost was not an Oprah Winfrey book club. Let's put it this way. So, cause if she thought everyone was going to be as rude as I was. And so I finally called her back, <laughs> she said, she's going to start this book club. My publisher said, well, don't expect anything too big out of that because people who watch daytime TV, they don't read books. That's funny. Mm -hmm. That's funny. Well, right. That was another <laughs> assumption. By the time she announced the reading club, by nine o'clock that night, there were 4,000 holds on the book at the New York Public Library alone. Wow. People engaged with that idea to a crazy degree. They absolutely went for it. Hook, line, and sinker. And for the next, what, there were, I think, 52 books in the original iteration of mm -hmm. the Oprah Winfrey Book Club. And Every one of them, with few exceptions, achieved an enormous amount of attention and success, but also started a conversation. And that's what I was so excited by, was that books are really meant, Dickens knew this, you know, and Herman Melville, books are meant to be gossiped about. They're meant for people to talk about them and gather and say, what did you think? Oh, I didn't like that guy at all. Well, I didn't believe that she was telling the truth. You know, that's what books are really for. Right. Well, I remember reading that book and it stayed with me for a long time. I think I read it a few times, kind of book you read uh -huh. here and there, you pick it up a few times. And we spoke a little while ago, be privately, that I thought it was about a different case, but it was, I mean, just tell everybody quickly the premise. I'm sure they all know because. Well, when I was uh, in high school, I believe, um, maybe I was, I think I was in high school. I became aware of the case of Stephen Stainer, who was kidnapped by uh, a guy who was uh, a pedophile, but also functioned as, if you will, a father to him. And he did not return to his family who believed he was dead for nine years when he walked away and went to a police station and said, I think my name is Steven. Um, wow. he, it was when the guy took a second little boy, Timothy White. And uh, so he then he didn't want to happen to that little boy what had happened to him, he walked away. Uh, that was the inspiration for the story. Now the real story, as we talked about, was much, much more horrible than the story that- right. Uh, you know, the deep end of the ocean was a difficult story, but the real story was much more horrible. The uh, kid, uh, Carrie Stainer was Stephen Stainer's older brother, became um, a feral misfit uh, and killed uh, three women in Yosemite where he worked. 
And, uh, and then Steven Stainer himself at the age of 24 was killed in a motorcycle accident. His family only had him for a few years. He was happy. He was married, um, but he was leaving his job and uh, a car hit him and he died. Yeah, it's come back to me. Yeah. How do you come up with all of the ideas for your stories? I know that's a silly question, but it's not comment? a silly question. <laughs> a little bit. I don't, um, I don't really, I am not, and you're going to say, oh, Jack, nah, but this is true. I'm not creative. Okay. I'm not like a <laughs> fantasy writer who creates a universe. I am not creative. I am someone who can adapt reality to make it new. But all of the stories that I write either came from the life of a friend or something I saw in the newspaper and research or something someone told me almost entirely. And the book that I'm working on now, as a matter of fact, the book that I've just started uh, comes from something really, really, really goofy and almost unbelievable in my own life. Um, that happened to me. Can you tell us or a, one sentence or not? Yes. <laughs> I came home one day. My father, I, I, I grew up on, in Chicago and my dad lived in Chicago until he died. And I came home one day to visit my dad and he wanted me to meet the woman that he was in love with. And I, I came into the kitchen and I looked at her and I said, you're Barbara Smalley. She said, yeah. And I said, we went to high school together. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yeah. And that's so, okay. Your reaction is just the reaction that I wanted you to Great. have. It's about a woman that gives nothing away because you find this out in the first few pages that a woman <laughs> is coming home to her home on Cape Cod to tell her father that she's going to have a baby and she's getting married. She's an underwater photographer, never expected to settle down. And he surprises her instead by telling her that he's marrying her best friend. Yeah. Well, and that's I'm, just the beginning. I look forward to that one as well. Yeah, these kind of stories interest me. They do. <laughs> that's, that's great. Well, let's bring it back to, have you ever had a friend like that? Well, this Jill, they, had, they loved each other and maybe hated each other or afraid of each other. Is that based on anything that? You know about um, not not really. I mean the uh, the the character of Jill was made up of a number of different people who I knew, uh, who who I have known over time, but in a general way, I created her to be a symbol of a suffering mother. I created her to be a symbol of someone who was denied justice. But then I wanted to make her human. And so what I often do in stories, and I bet other writers will tell you this, is that if someone has an unattractive personality, I try to make that person an extremely attractive person physically. I want uh, Some people, yeah, I want complexity. And, and, want, and a redeeming well, feature, maybe. Yeah. And I want people to be, um, I don't want people to, the characters to be what you would expect. I want everyone to be unexpected in the story that I create. Well, I'm not going to tell you this in public, but I have, I have a good idea for a story for you. I think it's something you could. Not, that would be great. Maybe that later. would be great. Now watch. <laughs> See, I'll end up writing it. Okay. I'll take a little cut. That's it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> that, that's funny. So tell us a little bit about your life. I mean, you've got a wide range of children, nothing too personal, but just tell us. You've got big children, little children. <laughs> I have big children, little children. I have really little grandchildren, uh, nice. one of whom is only... Uh, just newly hatched. She's uh, <laughs> Diana is just a little bitty baby uh, who was born a couple of weeks ago. Wow. And uh, I, I have children in their thirties. I have children who are still in high school. I was married twice. I was widowed in my thirties. And then I married a man who was somewhat younger than I am. He's still younger than I am, but you can't tell anymore. 
um, <laughs> because he's he's aged a lot from being married to me and from helping to raise our family. <laughs> But he also wanted to have a family. And I didn't feel that I could say to him, oh, okay, well, you have to raise my kids, but we aren't going to do any more of this. And then, as as my husband would say, our family is a date that just got out of hand. Um, <laughs> but, our, but I will say that our children have been... Um, with, with no exceptions, and I'm knocking on the um, uh, on my wooden counter here now. They have turned out well, and more than anything else, they like each other. Wow. And to me, that's more important than them liking us. Very nice. Well, how do you? What's what's your workday like? If with all these kids and responsibilities, how do you fit it in? And how long does it take? I um, I'm my. <laughs> I have very low standards for my children and for my <laughs> house. So, so generally if they're dressed and there's going to be some kind of vegetarian slop for them to eat, um, it's, uh, it's, uh, I feel that they're taken care of. That isn't really true, but my kids are, are self-reliant. I always have my eyes on them. Um, at, and even when they're not aware of that, but I, I think and pure, in terms of pure writing, when I'm working on a new project, I work, I write three hours a day. And after that, I start to get, I start to make mistakes and I can't bring the same energy when I'm writing something new. I can't bring the same energy to it okay. after the third hour. So then I'll do other things during the day. I'll do editing uh, on an editing project that I'm working on for someone else or I'll uh, do something to prepare for a lecture that I'm giving, but the pure writing part, usually only about three hours and probably three or four days a week. So how long did it take you to write? How long does it take you to write a book? Um, about nine or 10 months to finish oh. a draft and maybe a little more, sometimes a little less. Um, but that's a general, so I would say that from the beginning from the inception of the idea until the absolute finished book ready to be published with everything edited and all the periods and commas in the right place about 18 months. Well, wow, interesting. Um, so a few things you've written, I think it's, well, YA, it's 20, you write. 23 books now. That's yeah. what I thought. So a couple of questions on that. So is it Harder, easier to write adult books, YA books? Is there a different process? How, how does that work? Well, YA books, books for teenagers take place in a very um, discreet time period because okay. that's the way teenagers live. For them, a one, they say, you say, have you been dating for a long time? Yeah, a long time, like six months, you know? <laughs> so that is an era. Six right. months is an era if you're a teenager. And that makes sense because you become a different person. You physically become a different person with different cells after a six month period. Um, so their concerns are different. Their concerns are not global in the way adults are. The concerns are right in front of them. Right. And I don't, I don't write as much young adult fiction anymore. I think I did and said what I had to say, though I have one more idea that I'm really uh, thinking about often. But right now I'm concentrating on writing for adults and there is so much more mayhem that, I mean, the mayhem sure. that we get into with teenagers, uh, certainly there's drugs and sex and <clears throat> alienation and even death. But there's all kinds of emotional mayhem you can get into with adults, too, and the circumstances in which I put my characters, which are absolutely merciless. Yeah. So how, do, how you have a lot of longevity. How does it how do you maintain that success? Uh, I don't know whether I can maintain the success. I know that I I can maintain my excitement uh, about a story. At first, I think. The first thing I think when I finish a book is that's it. Never going to be able, I'm going to make pasta sauce for a living now because that's the thing that I know I'm really good at. And I, uh, I'm i never going to have another idea for a book. And then one starts to creep up on me. It's like having an affair. 
First, you're just <laughs> talking to the person on the phone and then you're meeting down at the mailbox and then you're sitting in the same car and pretty soon you're in love with someone else and you thought you would never love again. That's interesting. <laughs> Do you think it's harder to start out today or was it easier 25 years ago with your first book? I don't have any idea. Oh, I don't yeah. have, I know that there were fewer books published and there were so many the whole idea of self-publishing, of making your own uh, book and designing the cover and then selling it yourself and doing this marketing plan and distribution, that was unheard of. If you got right. uh, the an independent book was a book published by an independent publisher like Grey Wolf or something like that. Now, independent publishing means you're publishing your own book. So there are so many more factors that go into it. I would never want to be responsible in that way for a, for all the steps that go into publishing. That would make me nuts. I could not, I don't think I could, the business side of things still confuses me. <laughs> and, uh, and it's not because I'm a creative type or anything like that. It's because numbers confuse me. And, and I, I guess I have math effect, but I, when people say, oh, this is doing well, you know, I, I don't even want to know. I, I don't even want to know how well it's doing. Um, you don't look at the bestseller list over there. Oh, no, <laughs> oh, no, okay. no, no, no. I, one thing I do do is I read all my negative reviews though. Ah, really? Not necessarily the positive ones, because I know what, in a general way, what I did right. Interesting. But I always find out uh, something useful from reading a negative review, something that I won't do wrong the next time. Can you just so share an about. idea? What? Can you just share a sentence of a negative review that someone has ever, can you think of one? Um, that she put too much of a certain character in. Oh, okay. Well, the point where it got boring. Okay, interesting. Or it, this part, uh, one that was really very interesting to me, and this was a criticism, not of this book, but of a, another book, was that the two parts of the book did not seem to be entire, to, one didn't flow from the other. Oh, interesting. And I, on reflection, looking back, I agree with that. Oh, well, that's so you can use that piece of yes. advice. That's good. Yes. Yeah. Well, were there any characters you could have added to this book? Anybody you left out? Anybody you thought might be in it? No. no. I, I like to have a relatively small cast. Okay. People can walk on and walk out. But to, what I believe is that every character who has a big part in a story has to go through the whole cycle. Uh, in the in the narrative of change, because okay. everybody in a book changes. Everyone in a book, my great friend Karen Slaughter says, every character in a book has a, a secret. And I believe everybody has a destiny as well. Hmm. So that if I'm going to include a character other than someone who comes and brings a letter, you know, and right. uh, or something. Right. Uh, or sell someone a dress or that sort of thing. Uh, they're going to have to discover something about themselves and go through the whole cycle of evolution as a character. I always like to ask authors who you read, who do you particularly admire? Uh, um, I, everybody. Oh, but <laughs> if my, um, I, I, if uh, anything that uh, Elizabeth Stroud writes, I'm going to oh. read. Sure. Anything Ann Patchett writes, I'm going to read. Um, I love Emily St. John Mandel, who wrote uh, Wolf Hall and, mm. and now has uh, written a new book, um, The Glass Hotel, I believe, is the, the, the name of it. I love Jean Kwok. I love uh, Min Jin Lee. I, you know, I can do this all day. I, <laughs> um, I, and also classic authors that there's a book that I read every time I write a book, the same what book. What is that? It's what called that? The Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Oh, of course. We Betty's talked about Dad. that last week. Great. That is my yeah. favorite book. And oh. I believe it is a primer for anyone who wants to write a novel. 
because it's so beautifully constructed with the right amount of action and reflection that carries a story forward. Hmm. And so I hope that I'm keeping my eyes on that book as I go forward and hoping to imbue my characters with the same level of reality and uh, endurance that uh, her, that Francie Nolan had. And I love that book so much. My firstborn daughter is named Francie Nolan. Oh, that's fabulous. Well, we have a bunch of questions that came in. So let's start at some- I have a bunch of answers. Good. Well, here is a good one. Uh, But let me just, sorry. Carol would like to know, has this book been optioned for a film? It should Uh, be. Not yet, but (laughs) there's certainly, well, I'm not going to say that now because it'll just, you know, bring bad luck. But um, but I would, from your mouth to God's ears, I hope that that happens. And if if um, all my colleagues, all my other writer friends say, oh, I would never want Hollywood to get their hands, but they're lying. <laughs> they're lying. Well, tell us- of course they would want that to happen. How did it go when The Deep End of the Ocean was made into a film? It was like one long song. It was the best fun I went out there just for a couple of days, horsed around. It was a great time. Michelle Pfeiffer was an absolute doll baby, really sweet to me and to my son, Dan, uh, who was with me, who was, I think, 12 at the time and is now 32. Um, we, We had a wonderful time. Everyone was great. And the whole process was great. There was not, I, I'm not as, once a book is finished for me, it has to go out and earn its living in the world. And I'm not going to obsess about the ways in which a film version might be different or la, 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 la. It, it just doesn't mean anything to me. Do, do you see anybody in the roles? I, I have found, I, I know oh, who I'd like to see in this. Well, you tell me. I well, don't. I'd, like to, I'd like to see Meryl Streep. Oh. And the son, and I was trying to think of his name. He's the tall young man, blondish. Um, he's been in many, many films. And I actually can't think of his name. He was in Manchester by the Sea, that young man. Um, oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, uh, Ryan Gosling? No. No, no. I'm talking about oh. the boy. I will think of it. The boy. Yes. The boy. Oh, I know who you mean now. It's not Timothy Chalman. It's the other guy. That would work also, Timothy Chalman. Um. Oh, actually, he might be a second good choice. I actually saw him two days Casey ago Affleck, on the street. Somebody said Lucas. Well, he's Hedges. a little bit too. No, he's too Lucas old. Hedges. I guess, yeah. Yeah, Casey. Lucas. Affleck. Lucas Hedges. That's what I'm thinking. Right. Yes. I I even see him looking like Meryl Streep. I think that would be a very good combination. Ah, uh-huh. yeah. <laughs> and um, and though yes, it's the point is made in the book that though they are Greek, they're fair, right? To these people. Right. So Susan would like to know, is there one of you, any of your books that you hold especially close to your heart? There is. And it's a young adult book called All We Know of Heaven that also was based on a real incident in which, I don't know why I care so much about this book, but I enormously cared about the incident in which two young women, best friends, were in a horrifying car wreck. So much so one of them was killed the other survived, but they were both so badly damaged that the doctors did not, uh, doctors believed the other girl survived. So it was oh, weeks right. before their parents knew oh, yeah. that it, they had right. buried the other girl uh, thinking yeah. it was she. I did read that book. That was, yeah. Um, so that one, that one means a great deal to me. They all mean a great deal to me in different ways, except for one of them. And I'm not going to say which one, but I would like to put a stake through its heart. Wow. I never want it. anyone. I'm not going to mention it because people might read it and oh, judge oh. me. And buy it. Mm. <laughs> well, I have two questions, one from an Eleanor and one from a Sherry. And they're both kind of the same. Did I hear she has five adopted daughters in addition to three sons? But wait, it's a two-parter. And Sherry says, amazed by her personal life, how many kids does she have? If that's not too personal, she seems like an incredible superwoman. And how do these children of all varied ages feel about her novels? Well, I will. I can answer the last part first. Only one of my kids has ever read a book that I wrote. Oh, my. One. <laughs> and one book. It's got to be okay. a girl. One book. It is a girl. 
Sure. It's <laughs> one of my older daughters. I have four daughters and five sons. All four of my daughters were adopted. Um, and one of them has read one of my books. Now, I would say, I, I want to point out to you that I have offered my children money to read one of my books. I'm up to $125 now if they'll just read one book. No takers. And I think it's because they think if Jackie is doing this, this is going to be so boring. I don't need the money. You know, I'm just going to, I, you know, and I'm not going to lie to her. So I'll just pass that by. Thanks, mom. Um, <laughs> they are not fascinated by my career at all, except if someone famous would call on the phone. Oh, wow. That's oh, the wow. only, the only time that they would be um, fascinated or, or one of my friends who's a famous writer, then they're fascinated by that. And they want sure. to get Lisa Genova's uh, oh, sign up okay. book or something like that. Um, <laughs> and so that's how they feel about my work. They would be more fascinated if I worked at a, like at a snack well factory and could bring home snack wells. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Good sense of humor. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and, uh, uh, as far as them growing up, I have believed like, is it Lenora Skenazy who, who coined the term free range children? Yeah. That is what my children are like. Really? They don't know that the fence is there. I mean, they think that they're doing exactly what they want to do. But you're watching. They don't. Yeah, but I'm watching. You know, I'm always there. But the um, but they don't aren't aware of the fence until they come up against it. Wow. Well, I've said this every time I interview someone. It seems to come up. But I um, have offered my daughter money starting when she was 16 years old to read my favorite book. And now we're up to a couple of hundred dollars and she still hasn't. Hey, what is the book? It's Marjorie Morningstar. I've said that a few times already. (laughs) Oh, oh, you know, and you'd think they would want to do that for nothing to share something with their mother. I had to, I wanted my kids to watch the, I made them during the pandemic. I selected two books for them to read. And one of them was station 11 by uh, Hillary St. John and And, uh, and now I want them to gather together for one hour a week and watch the mini series made from that book on HBO, which is even better than the book. You would think that I asked them to have a little strychnine on their pizza. (laughs) And so, but finally I get them in there and I go, okay, you know, um, and I, I, I say to them, sorry to distract you from meaningless anime, meaningless death obsessed anime for half an hour. But, um, but in general, they are, they are a delight. They're a delight. They're engaging. They're combative. Um, they're smart. Well, maybe you'll have better better luck with your babies as they as they grow up. <laughs> yes, yes. I have to start them early. So this question you can or you don't have to answer. We could just pass right by. Will you be writing a book about a hometown boy posing as an investment counselor? Apparently, there's something. That's how I lost all my money. Yeah. Um, and, th- and that's what she's referring to. And no, I'll never write about that because, first of all, it's really boring to write uh, uh, the, about your own problems and the fact that you, you know, imagine how much some sympathy there would be for a story about someone who lost millions of dollars. You know, most people's reaction to that, most people was, I never had millions of dollars. Who gives, mm. a, who gives a poop yeah. about you and your problems? But it was extremely painful. My husband trusted a guy he should never have trusted. We lost everything, our home, every single thing, um, and uh, and had nothing left. We had enough to rent a U-Haul and move away. And so, and that happened not that long, nine years ago, almost nine years ago. Uh, I don't know whose hometown that the guy who did it to my husband um, came from. I would say Satan. Maybe he came from that hometown. <laughs> yeah. Um, and now he's in prison, but that doesn't do me any good because he uh, 
all the money that he built, not just from us, but from uh, from us, from my husband, and um, because I wasn't involved in this, and I'm glad I wasn't, um, is all he gave to his brothers, and his brothers hid it in another country. And is he in prison? Yep, but he won't. He'll be. He, He'll be like Rita Hayworth in the Shawshank Redemption. I mean, he, though a bad person instead of a good person, uh, he will be in, if he gets, tw- he, I think he got 25 years or 20 years. I, I'm sure he'll do eight because he'll did be he, a model prisoner and help everybody out. Did he do this to other people as well? He, he did it to other people. There were a, a total of 200 victims. Um, And I think $225 million total haul. One of the people, uh, this is all anecdotal. I mean, I can't prove this, but I was told about one of the victims was a young woman who with her three sisters had started a pediatric practice. They were all doctors. She took her own life uh, after he ruined them. So the you know, it's not trivial. I mean, the guy's a bloodthirsty monster. I was going to call him a mini Madoff, but not so mini. It's no, not the so same many. lines. Wow. Yeah. Well, you bounced back, I assume, right? And fi- not financially. I'll never bounce back financially. Never, um, because I was frugal. And yeah. back in the '90s, when I was making that kind of money, was funny back then. Remember, it was Mm. a different kind of money than we have now. And um, it, but I bounced back emotionally. And most importantly, I didn't kill or leave my husband. Um, (laughs) Most importantly, you didn't kill your husband. (laughs) I didn't kill my husband or leave him. Um, You would have had another book though. (laughs) Right. That I would have been able to have a lot of time to write because I would have been in prison. Um, But he, uh, I, he didn't mean it. Um, people said to me, you should leave him. I said, there's no financial advantage in me leaving him. And my kids would be part of a broken family. Then he's a good person. Uh, and you know, he loves them dearly. And, uh, and now I love him dearly too. And I'm glad that we were able to go forward. Wow. Good. Well, I'm sorry. (laughs) Um, Somebody wanted to know a little bit about prison language, how you knew so much about it. Partly from reading, but also I interviewed two mothers who had uh, kids in prison of that age, two boys who were in prison. One of, and she described uh, one of the, they described it to me this way. One said her son was a good son, but not a good boy. And that it was almost his destiny to go to prison and almost seen among his friends as a badge of honor. The other one was more like Stefan in which it was a shock and a, an outrage to the whole community that a kid like him with terrific parents would end up in prison. So I interviewed those people about their experiences with their sons being in prison. And also I was a newspaper reporter a hundred oh, years before. ago. Right. And I had been to prison a number of times, not as an offender, but believe <laughs> you me, yeah. when you go into one of those places and that door shuts behind you, you just can't believe that you're ever going to leave. And the thing about prison that is the most amazing is what I had the character Stefan say about it. It's not the loss of freedom. It's the loss of privacy, the fact that you never are alone and people cry and scream and talk and yell and sing all day and all night. And And they don't put the lights out. I learned that from your, I learned that from your book. I didn't know that. They dim the lights, but most Uh places they don't really put the lights out. So you're never really alone, even in your own skin. And so that must be a torment. Wow. Uh, well, there's one or two more interesting comments. Jean, like said, she disagrees with your premise, sorry, that the mother's role is more important in raising children. You spoke about the importance of your husband. Uh, what do you think of her comments? She, well, she's asking. No, I, I don't think it's, listen, if, um, if every father was as involved as my husband has been to the degree that he has been or some others, 
what I said was, and maybe I didn't state this clearly, it is more, it is considered that the mother is more of a functioning uh, force in a child's life than the father. Our culture considers the mother more influential in the raising of a child than the father, whether or not that is true. And therefore, the blame or the credit, often the blame, for what happens to the child is often laid at the um, at the feet of the mother more than the father. And I believe that that's yeah. true. It's just a belief. I can't prove that statistically. I can prove statistically that mothers are more involved in the child rearing process, uh, particularly when the child is little, but also going forward throughout the child's life than many fathers. It's just uh, a fact, you know, that when marriages break up, for example, it's very often not the father who has custody or the responsibility of raising the child, but the mother. That's the way, I guess that's the way human life works or even wolf life. I'm reading a book about someone who is a wolf researcher right now. Well, um, first of all, I agree with everything you're saying. <laughs> I, I do agree. A couple of more questions. Well, first of all, somebody would like you to repeat which is your favorite book. And it's... Uh, a Tree, Tree Grows, Grows in Brooklyn Correct. is my favorite book. <laughs> and I think it's just mm -hmm. a wonderful book. Everyone should read it, but everyone, especially who wants to write or thinks about writing, should read that story. I have lots and lots of favorite books, both old and new, uh, that I that I can that I read more than once, but that one stands alone. And I'm not the only writer. There's another book that is a book that I think is tremendously influential in my life. And it's the book True Grit by Charles Portis, the book, not the movie. Yeah. Um, it, it taught me everything about a character's voice. Were you a so, reader? Sorry. What? Were you a reader growing up? Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, anybody who, Oprah Winfrey will say the same thing. Anybody who comes from a family in which the parents are sort of at each other's throat or, or not around some of the time, that you, there you will find a reader. Books are a refuge. Interesting. But I wonder if it's changed for this uh, upcoming generation with um, the phones and the games. It most definitely must have changed. There are still readers and lots of teen readers and, and adult readers, but the competing media, the fact that people are always looking at their phones. If you look at pictures of a wedding at, of people at the table, at the dinner, they're all looking right. at their phones. Right. What the heck are they doing? They're at a wedding. Right. You know, what are they looking at? A circus right. or their Facebook page? It, 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 uh, social media has many wonderful uses. I don't think it should be like outlawed or anything. I think it's entertaining and in some ways sustaining, particularly when people are alone, but it also has, it casts a spell and the spell can be a toxic spell. Well, I agree with you. I was always a reader as a child and my favorite place to be was a library and it's pretty much still my favorite place to be and yeah. uh, surrounded by books. Um, and I guess we'll end with this very important question. Sybil would like to know, when did you know you were a writer? Well, it was a long time after everyone else did. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> I, uh, I majored in biology. I thought that first I thought I would be a doctor, but I was undone by calculus. And then I would thought I would be some kind of researcher. I still love science. I'm just enthralled by it and every part of it. And, um, but people kept saying, you know what you should do? You're really a good writer. Ah. And uh, <laughs> I became a medical reporter uh, right out of college and did that for ages. And then actually my first husband who died very young, I was widowed when I was very young, um, would say to me, you should write a novel. You should write a novel. And right at the, at the moment of his death, within days, I started The Deep End of the Ocean. I guess that was a bit of a salvation for you in some it ways. It was, right? it was to try to yeah. do something 
impossible. That was my goal, to try to do something that I thought I couldn't do to prove to myself and my children that there was life after death, right? Inspiring. And how did you then get an agent and et cetera, get it published? I, um, I knew a woman who had an agent. That's how most people find uh, they have a friend or a first cousin or something like that who has an agent, regardless of what it's for. I knew a friend who had an agent. I uh, asked her if she would read this story. I had no idea whether it was even a novel because I knew how novels, I knew what novels, what it was like to read them. I had no idea what it was like to write one. And uh, she did, and she sold it within three days. Well, you figured out how, <laughs> how to write one. Apparently, yeah, <laughs> apparently. Uh, Jackie, I could talk to you all day, and I think people could listen to you all day and wow. um, actually love to <laughs> continue this conversation at some point. Um, thank you so much for being with us. Um, you know, lots of people watch, and everybody loved it, and you were just terrific, and please keep writing. And um, Thank you so much. This has been a wonderful interview. And I can just feel the sort of energy of the audience. I can feel the people oh, and their good. questions. They're so thoughtful. Uh, and to devote this much time to reading, I can't thank you enough. Wow. I hope everybody reads this book. You will enjoy it. Uh, I'd also just like to invite everyone to come back next week. I think it's March 1st, same time. Quan Julie Wang has an incredible new book called Beautiful Country. Very, very interesting. Thank you, Jackie. We'll talk again. Bye. Bye-bye.